Hey everybody, Mr. Hayes, and we are talking statistics, we are talking confidence intervals and significance tests for means. We're moving into the means section, and in fact, this is day two of it. So we're going to go through and kind of review it, formalize things, and talk a little bit about a very special case that can be very helpful, especially if you get stuck on your AP test. So last year, we um, took body temperatures of everybody in class to see if that 98.6 degree normal temperature the doctors always tell you is or actually probably your mom tells you um, is actually normal, which is a little ironic giving our circumstances of 2020 and 21. But this was the data that I had last year at 98.416 as a mean. My standard deviation was 0.793 degrees. And then my sample size was 20. And it tells you in here to go ahead and think of our classes as a simple random sample for all high school students. So we don't have to worry about that section or that part there. Um, and again, just as a reminder, all these notes are in the link down below. All sorts of other fun stuff as we're coming up towards review. I've got a three-week review course there. Please check it out. Anyway, so do the data provide convincing evidence that mean normal body temperature is different than the doctor's claim? Now, notice here it says, is it different? Okay, so that means that we're going to do a two-sided test. We don't care if it's higher or lower. We're just wanting to know, is 98.6 actually it or is it something else? So here's the data, um, or here's the state section. The parameter is going to be the true mean body temperature for all high school students. There's my statistic for my sample. The two hypotheses, either the mean is going to, the null hypothesis, so we're assuming everything the doctors say is true, is 98.6 is the mean body temperature. And the alternative hypothesis is saying that it's not 98.6. And we are going to go to a 5% alpha value here as a at our significance level. It doesn't say it up here. However, remember 5% is kind of our default for that. Our name of our procedure is a one sample t-test for means. Make sure that you say all of it, how many samples, what type of test, and then what you're doing it for. And now here for the do, lots of stuff. Um, so our test statistic, just like before, statistic minus a parameter divided by our standard error of the statistic. So here is the specific one. T is going to equal X bar minus the mean divided by my standard deviation of the sample divided by square root of N. Now, quickly over here, this is what we've been doing before. This is what we're going to be doing now. And notice how similar these things are. Okay. Now, again, the reason why we're doing this is because obviously... The bigger the sample, the closer it's going to get to an actual normal curve, is we don't know if it's normal or not. Um, but we're going to come back to this idea here in a little bit. And then the work here, our sample was not extremely exciting. Um, we got a T value of a negative point or 1.038, which we automatically, you should kind of in your gut say, okay, well, that's probably not going to happen because it's not that many standard deviations away if we were treating it like a Z value. So I get a T value of negative 1.038, and that translates to, so again, remember, this is just, oops, this should have been over here. This should be negative 1.038. This would be positive 1.038. So notice here, since we're doing two samples, we have to go both to the left and to the right. This value of 15, or 0.156 probability is one side, so we have to double it in order to get our actual P value. So it's about 30, just over 30% chance that what we saw was going to actually happen. So the first part here, we're going to interpret it because, again, you need to tell people <clears throat> this is what we got. And this is the explanation of the math. So assuming that the null hypothesis is true, that the true mean of all high school students' body temperature is 98.6, there is a 0.312 probability of getting an sample mean of 98.416 or lower or 98.74 98.784 or higher now again how did um purely by chance how did i get this into value just like here how i had a negative value and a positive one i took the difference between 98.416 which was our sample mean and the null hypothesis value what we're assuming the mean is and then we added it to move it to the other side Okay, so again, it's kind of like that margin of error that we were using for um, confidence intervals. So we go below it and above it. So now for the conclusion, B 
because 0.312 is bigger than my alpha value of 0.05, we fail to reject the null hypothesis. We do not have convincing evidence that the mean body temperature of high school students is differ, different than 98.6. Now, the neat thing which Statsmedics does here, and those are the guys, I forgot to mention them up above, those are the people who put the, a lot of this together um, that I'm mod slightly modifying it from, but not much, is that remember how I said here, how it's like a margin of error, how I went down the same amount, as, or I went up the same amount as I went down? So what we end up doing is we start comparing this two-sided test to confidence intervals. So let's take a look. So let's say another class did the activity and had these results. Their mean was 97.9. Their standard error was 1.6 and their normal uh, and their sample size normal. Well, their sample size was 30. So using a calculator you can figure out your t-test here is 0 0.023. Okay. So the question is would could I reject it at a alpha value of 10%? Yep. Because this is less than 10%. Could I reject this at an alpha value of 5%? Yeah. Could I reject this at an alpha value of 1%? No. Why not? Because it's not in there. It just it, Because again, notice this 1% is less than that. Now, what would happen if we turn this into confidence intervals? So I'm going to take this 97.9. I'm going to find the margin of error at, oh, I don't know, let's say a 90% interval. Now, notice these are related. So if I figure out what the 90% confidence interval is, so I go down and above, down and above, <laughs> um, the setup on that, this is what I get. I get 97.04 and 98.396. Is that enough to reject my null hypothesis? Yeah. Why? Because notice 97.9 is within there. So we were rejecting it. We're saying, yeah, 97.9 isn't in my means, isn't in my interval, so that means it can't happen, right? We are 95% confident that 97.303 to 98.479 captures the true mean body temperature of American high school students. So can we reject the null hypothesis? Well, yeah, if we're 95% confident that this is about the interval, 97.9 is in there. Yeah, see a null hypothesis. And then over here, same idea. 99%. Ooh, where's 97.9? 97.9 would be up over here. So can we reject the null hypothesis? No. And so what ends up happening is that these two-sided tests effectively are acting like a confidence interval. Now, the one thing which I'm going to say about that is this. Depending upon what your, who your audience is, you may want to just decide what you're going through. Because here, just saying that, okay, I'm 99% confident that we've got the reading that we're in here, it does kind of leave it, oh, it's like, well, so you're 1% not sure? True. The benefit of going up here and doing the two-sided test is that you get an actual probability. So if you're saying I've got a 30% chance of seeing what I'm seeing, that's pretty convincing. What I feel like is for me personally, it kind of depends about how far away from the interval you are. So if my sample mean is far, far away, to steal a phrase, um, from the edges of what my interval is, it might be a good idea to figure out what my p-value is, because that's going to give you a very, very small number. Let's say your p-value is 0 0.005, or 0 0.0005, I mean, like really small. You're like three, four standard deviations away. You want to emphasize how unlikely that is. I'm not sure that saying it's outside of a 99% confidence interval will do that. But in a pinch, if you get stuck on this, I do know from seeing, and you can look at this, and you'll probably do this when you start um, getting closer to reviewing for the AP test. On questions like this, the rubrics will have both a, a significance, two-sided significance test and a confidence interval. And you can use either of them so long as you draw the correct conclusion. Okay, So the decision of whether or not to reject the null hypothesis is the same using a confidence interval or a significance test. Okay, So... If you get stuck, it's okay to use one or the other. Just make sure you read carefully enough to make sure that you're using it in the right context. Okay? So I hope that was helpful. We're going to formalize this on the other side. We're going to spell out our four steps, and we're going to kind of get a better idea of how these two are connected. And I'll see you in a minute.